very good. Welcome to Kaveri Hospital. We have an interesting case lined up. Let me introduce uh, the team today. Very good. Uh, I am Gopal Amogan, cardiologist. To my right is uh, interventional cardiologist uh, Dr. Anand Raman. And to my left is our uh, chief uh, surgeon, part of a heart team, uh, Dr. Prashant Vaijana. And to my rear is uh, Professor Dr. Deshpande from Nagpur. Uh, he's the cardiac surgeon, uh, chief of cardiac surgery at uh, Deshpande Heart Center. And the patient we have here is uh, a lady JS who has been operated by Dr. Deshpande uh, a decade ago, who now has valvular dysfunction, hence the patient is here on table. And the year of this one is here to give us all his inputs. On echocardiography, we have Dr. Chandrasekhar, uh, chief echocardiologist uh, from Mayo Clinic, who will be guiding us with echocardiogram. Uh, anesthesia, we have Dr. Arun, who's the chief uh, anesthesiologist, cardiac anesthesiologist here. And we have uh, several uh, technical teams here. We have uh, Santosh. Um, Tangaraj and Satiraj on uh, uh, technical uh, side, and we have manual and uh, uh, and others uh, here to help out. So uh, let me start off with the case. Can we have the presentation, please? So our patient is a 66-year-old uh, lady uh, who has symptoms of shortness of breath. She has been apparently in major class 3 for uh, several months, including admission to hospital with pulmonary edema requiring a decongestive therapy. She had a previous mitral uh, valve disease and aortic valve disease resulting in her having surgical double valve replacement in 2010. Uh, she has normal calories uh, as of this year. Yeah, and she's in permanent fibrillation. Yeah, no, then we'll come Next back slide. to the other one. Next slide. Uh, this is a surgical history which is of uh, most relevance uh, to this case. She has a 27 millimeter epic valve in the mitral position and uh, she has a 19 millimeter epic supra in the aortic position. Next slide. This is a current x-ray, uh, cardiomegaly, otherwise the lung is largely uh, unremarkable. Next slide. This is a VCG, uh, rate controlled permanent atrial fibrillation. Next. Echocardiogram, I think I will let uh, Professor Chandrasekhar speak now and he will show the uh, screen. Can we switch to the slave echo screen and uh, camera to Dr. Chandrasekhar? Uh, hi, um, uh, good evening. I think the major issue in this case was... Uh, Can we have the echo on the slave uh, screen? Recognize the fact that the mitral process is, is not functioning well. She was admitted three times with pulmonary edema and mitral regurgitation was documented. We don't see the echo, However, Gopi. The IOD valve great. Uh, okay. Can we get the echo screen, please, as a picture in picture? So, till, till they get the picture, I'll tell you the, you know, the brief uh, issue. The IOD gradient was found to be around 40 millimeters and the mean was 25. So there was a question whether yeah, IOD valve is really having a problem and when we do the mitral processes, should the IOD valve be also tackled simultaneously? So here, I don't know whether the pictures are there. No, you turn the screen, sir. At least you turn your screen. have a technical issue with the Sorry, slaved uh, some, uh, echo screen. As usual, whenever there's a meeting, there's always a technical issue. So now we can, can you all see this through the video? We, we see it well now, thank you. 
Okay. Let me put about me now. So this is a TEE, transgastric view. One of the major things we wanted to exclude is, is aortic prosthesis working well. So in this case, if you look at it, the transgastric view, LV, RV, RA, and aortic root, and aortic valve. Aortic cusps are moving very well, both, and there's no panels or anything underneath. Then we will get a gradient. What is happening? So here is a gradient. The maximum gradient is about 11 to 12 millimeters of mercury. And then the mean gradient is 6 to 7 millimeters of mercury. And the ejection time is about 90 milliseconds. And the cusp opening and closure lines are also well seen. So this clearly points out to us that the valve is working very well. And we don't know the gradient of 40 and 25. That could have been at the time of our admission. We don't know about that. So currently, the process is working well. And there is a mild aortic regurgitation. Go to the mitral valve, sir. So yes. now I'm going to show you the mitral valve quickly. So as you can see, see here, uh, this is a this is aortic root and aortic valve, and as already you see that closer to the aorta mitral junction area, there is a regurgitation jet starting. And also, if you look at it here, the coaptation is not intact. And, and I'll show you that in a better. Just give me, bear with me for a second. This is a LV which is working very well. And again, we are looking at aortic. No, this is a mitral gradient. Mitral valve. So there is a significant turbulence because of increased regurgitation that is coming through. And the mean gradient, what we are getting was around 8 to 12, and the peak was varying from 15 to 18. And go forward, you want to show the CPI? Okay, right? so back to the presentation, please. Dr. <coughs> Dr. Chandrasekhar, how much is EF? And how much yes, is sir. mean PA pressure? EF is. Uh, the, uh, very good. No, that's a very good question. Uh, the mean, mean PA pressure is about 60 millimeters is the RA of a TR velocity and RA pressure. LA. LA. LA is 40. LA was 40. 4. 4 zero. 40. LA 40. So, so I think the, the my PA pressure probably around 65 to 70 millimeters. And what about EF ejection? And the EF is around 45 to 50. 45 to 50%. So you are underestimating mitral regurgitation because of low EF? Uh, the, the no, not really though. I think the ERO comes up to be 0 0.3 and regurgitation volume was coming up to be around 40 millimeters. Well, the, the 40 MR 40 clearly MR. is significant enough, uh, whatever that uh, number may be. Clearly, it's causing uh, uh, pulmonary congestion for the patient and symptoms. Uh, uh, your point very well taken. Clearly, if she had a better LV, we'll probably see a bigger jet uh, in the left atrium. 
Or the other slide, please. Or the other uh, thing is uh, with the severity of the MR, probably the LV we are not. Uh, it's probably not 45. It is probably 40 or 35 because of the severity of the MR. The LV function we are overestimating. That's another thing. So, in terms of planning this case, we we were actually pleasantly relieved uh, this uh, afternoon when we started this case because when we did transthoracic echoes, our peak gradient across the aortic was uh, 35 to 40. So we couldn't see high definition images of the aortic. So we were not sure whether the aortic will need uh, addressing also in the same sitting. But we were prepared for a double valve uh, implantation. So to plan that, uh, we have done CT and uh, I will go through our plan. So to know the valve, uh, I hope you can see on the uh, PowerPoint, Winnie Bappett's, uh, from Winnie Bappett's app, the 27 millimeter epic in the mitral position has an ID of about 23 millimeters. So we have chosen a 26 millimeter Sapien S3 valve, which is uh, uh, the valve for the mitral valve in valve implantation today. Next slide. Next slide. With the aortic, the patient had a 19 millimeter supra, which gives us an internal diameter of 16.5. Uh, so, knowing that the gradient previously was 30, we were not sure whether this was a, a small uh, valve causing the gradient or indeed valve dysfunction. So we had to be prepared for a double valve uh, uh, implantation. The valve we chose for this is an Evolutar uh, 23 millimeter, which we have uh, also here uh, ready to be crimped if need be. And then the plan was to crack the uh, Epic valve with a 18 millimeter uh, Atlas Gold balloon, a non-compliant balloon, and uh, that is our experience. Uh, where uh, we have to do a valve in valve in a small valve, we tend to crack the bioprosthetic, which gives uh, pleasing uh, simultaneous gradients. But having said that, now the TOE uh, suggests probably the LV, the, the aortic valve integrity is pretty good, so uh, we can't make that any better. So uh, we are going to hold off with the aortic for the moment, we're going to fix the mitral reassess the aortic and then make a decision. So that's the uh, sapien valve. The valve we're choosing is a 26, which has a height of 20. Next slide, please. These are some uh, CT uh, analysis images uh, that uh, I'm displaying here. You can see here we are measuring the CT-based uh, IDs of uh, the analysts. Uh, next slide. This is a, a very important uh, uh, analysis uh, that one has to make, which we have done on this case too. This is the aotomitral angle. What this determines is uh, the patient's risk of LVOT obstruction, because when we implant a sapien valve, we're going to cover, we're going to make that uh, epic mitral valve into a covered stent. Therefore, the narrower this angle the higher the chance of uh, LVOT obstruction, but thankfully it is not that narrow, it's fairly wide, and uh, this is a systolic frame that you're seeing, and uh, therefore we, we are pleased that uh, our chances of LVOT obstruction is small. Next slide. This is just uh, uh, to give, a, this is just a measurement of the uh, valve length to give us a feel for where the valve is likely to end, a 20 millimeter valve in the mitral position. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, just to show uh, the transeptal point uh, on four chamber view. Uh, next slide. This is some uh, analysis of the aortic valve too, in case we had to do that. This is the aortic supra epic valve, 19 millimeter. Next slide. And this is just to measure the uh, sinuses at the coronary level and uh, we were uh, reasonably comfortable with this uh, as the chance of coronary obstruction from here is going to be small because sinus is measured about 30 uh, millimeter. Next slide. 
this is uh, another uh, view also of the sinuses, slightly higher, right exactly at the ostium of the left coronary. You can see here. Um, having said that, the left coronary is a very short left uh, coronary, left main, so therefore coronary protection is out anyway. Next. Next slide. Uh, these are coronary measurements. Next. For uh, height from uh, the uh, aortic uh, annulus. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. And this is just to show uh, roughly where we need to get our transeptal to have enough working length in the uh, left atrium for the uh, sapient balloon, for the, for the Edwards balloon uh, to work. Next slide. So we'll just move on to the setup. Camera here, please. So uh, you can see here we uh, have uh, several tubes on the left and right groin. So we have a left femoral artery with a six French sheath. The other one. We have two left femoral vein sheets, one for the temporary wire and the other for upsizing to an ECMO cannula should we need that at any point. To the right, the right femoral vein, uh, we have an uh, uh, Edwards sheath and uh, on the uh, right femoral artery, we have a six French arterial uh, in case we need to take, a, uh, take a, a, another Edwards sheath for uh, the uh, aortic valve and valve. So we'll move on to the uh, fluoros. We'll just show you what we've done. Gopi, can we just pause so we there? Started there's, 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 there's punctures. Gopi, the, just a few questions, I think, yeah. from the panel. There's one question from me, just so it's not left as sure. a, ling a lingering question in the minds of anyone in the room. But are you clear of the mechanism sure. of the mitral regurgitation? Yeah, so can we just show the uh, close-ups of the leaflets? We're just uh, bringing it up now. Can we get the slaved... Uh, uh, echo screen, please. That is going to shed more light. Can yeah, you see the slave screen? We can. Okay, great. Uh, over to you, Dr. Chandrasekhar, yeah. on the echo, please. If you can uh, give us some insights on the mechanism of this mitral valve dysfunction. Can you, can you all see the images? Yes. Yes or no? Yes, yes, yes we can. It's nice and clear. Yeah. So if you look at it here, look at the cusp here, and the regurgitation is because I'll show you the area of avulsion of this cusp from the sewing ring. And as a result, the supporting is mechanism is not there. So here you can see this periodically comes and goes. So now if you look at it here, there's hardly any tissue because the part of that is not moving at all. Now you can see that the regurgitation degree. So wide vena contractor, severe regurgitation, and the left and the posterior cusp junction area, this is oval, and that's not moving well. And part of this leaflet is also degenerated, as you can see. But primarily, the regurgitation is due to prosthetic valve degenerations, part of the degenerations from the so sewing ring. Yeah. That's okay, very great. clear. That's, that's a fantastic demonstration. I hope that uh, uh, that uh, shows the mechanism there. Uh, so let's go to the fluoro uh, grab screen, please. It is nice to know. So we started with a left femoral artery axis, as you can see. 
Bernard, what, were there any more questions before we continue? I think Antonio wants to make one point. I just have one comment about screening sure. of the cases from educational point. Sometimes um, uh, trying yeah. to get the NEO LVOT area is al always useful. When it's more than 180 or 200 square millimeters, Absolutely. it's safe. The other thing, it's a porcine yeah. uh, leaflets, which is makes me comfortable when I have a narrow NEO LVOT since the open cells will be always free when you have a, a gray zone uh, NEO LVOT. That's what I wanted to uh, add. And a final point, yeah. we, we just uh, want to uh, be confident that you, you, have you have you excluded endocarditis in this patient, just as a point of principle? Yes, yes, we have. So this patient uh, has been uh, suffering with this uh, MR for a few months. She's had cultures done. There's no clinical uh, signs of uh, infection, no fever, and her numbers, especially ESR, CRP, white cell are normal, and her cultures have been negative. Okay, no more questions. On you go. So, moving on. Okay, great. So, moving on to the fluorals, we started with the uh, left femoral artery axis. Next. We then got a left femoral vein axis, you can see. Next. Next. And uh, as a routine practice with a crossover uh, fluorograph, uh, we did a puncture of the right femoral artery in case we have to upsize for uh, an 18 French sheath uh, to do uh, a TAVA aortic valve and valve. Next, please. Next, please. And then a, left, a right femoral vein axis you can see here. Next. Uh, a temporary wire, a balloon tipped wire was positioned in the RV. This is the REO view. Uh, and uh, the right femoral vein uh, entry site was uh, dilated with a 14 French sheet. Uh, subsequently, we proceeded with uh, the transeptal. Next, please. Uh, this is an SRO sheet and uh, and a BRK uh, that will follow. Uh, I think different people use different uh, sheets, uh, but this is what uh, uh, that uh, I'm very comfortable with, uh, as most electrophysiologists would be. Uh, next one, please. Next. And here, fluoroscopically, we were happy. We were somewhere in the true fossa. Let's move to echo, which is the most important. This is the REO. This is the REO and LAO of the puncture uh, point. Let's show the echo, please. Going on the top. You can see here, uh, sir, can you uh, uh, tell us a bit on the echo, please? This is the RA and LA, it's the aortic root, and it's the interatrial septum. You can see the tinting of the interatrial septum. It's at the mid fossa valis area, and uh, we verify that now this is a long axis view where you see the SVC here, IVC here, and it is in the mid portion. So Dr. Gopal Murugan wanted to come a little bit more inferior. And I think the few other views, yes. they were able to get that. And I think beyond that, I really don't think that uh, anything I can show. And he also measured the distance of the puncture side to the access to the valve. So this will, if you are very close to the valve, probably <coughs> navigating that will be a problem. The higher uh, will be better. But on the other hand, if there was any issues in the medial area, then probably we would have liked to have gone for lower area. But in this case, the valve in valve, probably going as high and posterior will be better. Great, thank you. So basically, the uh, the spot we're trying to get is a very low and posterior puncture, so that on RAO we have a very straight trajectory to the mitral valve. That is the idea. Let's go to fluoro, please. Okay, so that was the RAO uh, point before puncturing, just to make sure. 
that fluoroscopically that fits in with where we want to be too. Next. 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 Okay, there we go. We, we punctured and uh, you can see contrast in the left atrium. Next. Next. And uh, once we are into the left atrium, uh, we took an agilis and uh, uh, a JR4 uh, with a straight wire. You can see here. Next. 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 This is just exchange to the agilis. We have not crossed the valve yet. You can see the agilis uh, pointing down south towards the valve. Uh, next. And we put a JR4 initially. Next. Next. That JR4 was exchanged with a pigtail, and over the pigtail, we went with a Lundequist. Uh, this is a fluoro of the LV, just to get a feel for the LV volume, how big it is, and how the pigtail is sitting, so that we have a very nice and smooth uh, Lundequist. Next. 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 Okay, so there we go. So we got the uh, Lundequist in, and once the Lundequist was in, uh, then uh, we decided to uh, dilate the septum, and uh, we are using a 12 millimeter Mustang peripheral balloon. Next. So you can see there, there was a little bit of waste, and as we went up with the pressures to nominal, that opened up. So our practice has been, we normally dilate it and leave it there. Uh, and uh, leave it there until the valve is loaded uh, because it uh, makes the hole nice and well organized and makes the uh, 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 transport of the system through the septum very easy uh, when we're ready to go. So to add a bit more on to the uh, image guided intervention in this uh, OR, we, we are very fortunate to have uh, a heart navigator. We have a heart navigator 3 which is the uh, latest version, in fact, the only one now in the country. So we can show some images from the Heart Navigator. Can we go to the Heart Navigator, please? Navigator screen. Deepak. Okay. Give me the Navigator, please. The LA pressure uh, was 40. Uh, we will try and show that also. Okay, so here we are in the navigator. Well, what the navigator is, the patient's uh, CT scan is uh, feeded into the system and that, that generates a volume rendered image automatically, be it uh, a tower or mitre or any structural intervention. So here, we have just done a volume rendered image of the systemic circulation to encompass LA, LV, and the mitral valve. Just show us the uh, uh, actual volume rendered images, please. No, give us the volume rendered image, top right, top right. Okay, great. So that's what you get. This is just instantaneous, literally instantaneous, uh, very high volume volume rendered image, and. Uh, uh, normally, we'd like to leave a couple of sternal wires. Uh, that is the marker to, uh, to co-register with the fluoroscopic screen. Now we're going to register this to the fluoroscopic screen, and then we will have continuous heart navigation uh, because uh, it is quite useful in this uh, valve-in-valve -valve procedure because the EPIC valve is known to be less fluoroscopically uh, opaque than others, so it might add an extra layer of uh, imaging safety. So over to you, uh, Dr. Prabhu or uh, Dr. Anantraman, if you want to uh, say something whilst I do, whilst I get the uh, heart navigator images. Can we get the superimposed Bernard? image? Bernard, can you hear us? We still hear you very clearly. Your commentary is so yeah. thorough that yeah, we yeah. haven't uh, interrupted you. Thank you. Okay. Bernard and Antonio, for both of you. Uh, do you use this heart navigation system in London and uh, how did you find it? So we, we have an equivalent, we have the Philips Echo Navigator system which allows similar fusion technology and we have also some uh, experience with the FIOPS modeling system 
and an overlay system with GE that allows you to do exactly what you've uh, illustrated there. And I'm going to use it in a case that I'm going to show in the nightmare session later on. So I think it is very useful. It provides additional information. And I think as we do more and more complex structural interventions in the future, this sort of fusion imaging is going to be increasingly important. Absolutely, because some of these bioprosthetic valves, they are not fluoroscopically good. Especially this one, all you can see is a very thin wire. So in this particular case, we are finding it very, very useful, this hot navigation system. For, can uh, we show procedure. the hands also? Antonio, did you have a comment? No, I mean, uh, we don't use it for the mitral. We used it for a couple of left atal appendage. It's very useful for the appendage uh, closure. So you can see here, we're going to rotate between LAO and RAO. We are in a LAO screen. Move to RAO, please. And the heart, uh, the embedded image moves with the uh, fluoro screen, giving you a continuous uh, uh, image bedded information on where you are at any point in time. So now we're ready to go and uh, take the valve. So uh, we have dilated the septum enough. Let's uh, go. come off heart navigation. Just show the epic valve, please. Uh, let's get a coaxial view of the epic valve. Just come off heart navigation. Do you have any concept at this stage, Gopi, about your distribution of the valve in terms of ventricular and atrial uh, implantation? Are you going to go 50-50, 60-40, yes. one way or the other? What are your thoughts? So basically, we hope to have 40% uh, uh, in the left atrial side and 60% on the ventricular side. Uh, we, we, just, we just normally, in terms of positioning, reverse what we would do for a TAVI basically leave the bottom end of the middle marker just below, i.e. towards the left ventricle side of the epic marker, if I'm making sense. Mm -hmm. Because the valve should shorten from the left atrial end and we will end up with a 40-60 uh, distribution, uh, I hope. So on the fluoroscopic screen, which you can see, can we come off heart navigation, please? Okay, what we're trying to get uh, on uh, the fluoro screen on RAO is to try and get the epic valve, uh, the, 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 the actual thin line, uh, the sewing ring, to be absolutely as, uh, uh, as much as a line rather than a ring. Can you go a bit cranial? I, I don't know if you can appreciate this uh, there because it's hard enough to see it even here. I'm sure it's uh, unless you have very sharp eyes uh, there at the stage. Well, okay, the, the, that the, looks good to me. The quality of the imaging is very good, and we can just make it out with you. We appreciate your difficulties, but we see it. Okay. Excellent. So that gives me reassurance. Uh, so let's go on hard navigator, please. And uh, we're ready for the valve. So let's uh, get a 26 valve. Kopal, before you go with the valve, Suppose your puncture is not yeah. in the optimum location, do you have any special catheters to enter the valve or yeah. you still use the same one? No, I think Agilis uh, is my favorite uh, because it, it, you just can get anywhere in the left atrium or anywhere in the heart with a deflectable catheter like uh, Agilis. So your best bet is to use an Agilis uh, uh, if you have it and that allows you to get to any spot. Uh, uh, and uh, you can enter the LV. But sometimes if the puncture becomes very high, then it becomes very difficult to, because the trajectory, you, the, the, the sheath has to go all the way up and then come down, and you will not get enough support. If that happens, we've ended up in some uh, inadvertent punctures, uh, then you will have to puncture the LV. Uh, usually we use a uh, five French and then snare that wire out. Once you snare that wire out, then it, it, it'll, it'll, go, it'll go through. Uh, and then you'll have to close the LV puncture side with, a, with an ADO, which is the best. Uh, anything to add, uh, Dr. Prashant? We are good to go. Get the valve, please. Uh, Bernard, in your lab, how often do you check the ACT, the left-sided procedures? Well, you need to be more and rigorous than you would with a TAVI. Number one, because the procedure is quite long. Uh, sec partly because we keep asking you questions. But secondly, because, of course, the uh, likelihood of thrombus in the left atrium is much higher. 
So I would, we would be measuring an ACT uh, initially to have a target of 300, and we would probably be checking it every 20 minutes yes. or so. Absolutely, that's exactly what we've been doing. We are keeping it around uh, 250 to 350, and every 15 to 20 minutes is being checked. Yes, but you, you can also be generous in flushing the issues, which we don't do regularly in several cases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Point That's very, very important because we are working on a left side system here. And we have to avoid any air MLS, any other form of MLS. So the, 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 you can talk a bit about the mitral program, sir, how it started? No, this uh, is loading the valve. No, there's one important aspect. I think Gopi will tell you yes. in terms of the valve loading compared to the aortic position. So could you get it up here, please? If you can appreciate here, because I don't want to take the uh, pusher, the loader off, you can see here the skirt is on the uh, proximal end and uh, on the distal end it's non-skirted. Because the valve is going to be from top to bottom like this, this is going to be the left atrial side, this is going to be the left ventricular side, so our flow will be on this direction. This is just a check. Uh, we have done it uh, before, but this to demonstrate to the audience. It has to go up. I think one one point I would like to for, would like to say is that the one patient is a quite a short yeah. lady, and then we have to withdraw the e sheet little bit because it has to be an in vivo loading of the valve. Otherwise, you will enter into the straight away right up. atrium, Down. and oh, you will have to load in the right atrium. This is a S3, so we have to do an in vivo loading. The other important uh, point in this step is uh, normally one would yeah. keep the Edwards facing up yes. on the sheet because it retroflexes towards the right. But now uh, for a mitral, we keep the Edwards uh, facing down because we're going to uh, retroflex towards the left. Another point to bear in mind. Yeah. Yes. Hold that the wire, please. Like, uh, Antichrist. Okay. Give me some support. Check the wire, please. Abu, Abu, Abu. Too much tension. Okay. Just ease off on the wire, please. Yeah. Ease off on the wire, please. Okay, the valve is out. Yeah. Okay, let's load the wire valve. Just a here. fluoro. Can you show the valve, please? Fluoro. Just the wire. Yeah. Just keep the wire for me. Yeah, just keep the fluoro there. Don't move. Yeah, don't move. Keep it there. You can see we are right at the intra uh, Just the wire for me, please. Yeah. IBC. Plus, uh, get the paddle lights off the wire, please. There's paddle lights for the valve, Santosh. Perfect, perfect. That's good. Keep it there. Gopi, did you give the wire any extra special flexion or is it just in its natural shape? It's in its natural shape, Bernard. Yeah. We've had a few cases where the, the wire support from a safari, or we haven't used the Lundquist, but from a safari hasn't been quite enough, and we've given it an extra man-made curve to take it around the shape of the atrium through the septum and into the ventricle. Just a little learning point that we picked up after our second or third case. As he's going in right now, he is anti-flexing also and then introducing it. You can see that. Let go. Yeah. Antonio made a good point regarding a neo LVOT. We had measured the neo LVOT was 240 at the resting stage and following while okay. deployment was the valve. So you see how easy now it's beautiful. Okay, save that please. So let me get the pusher out and then uh, we'll go to the implant view. Just going to 
go a bit more deep. So, Antonio, we should leave uh, Gopi to, um, to, to work quietly with the team in the lab. Antonio, any particular tips and tricks with the wire here to try and get the, the device coaxial across? The, view, please? The, the first thing when, uh, to mention when you pull back the pusher, the, the flex catheter, you have to make sure, as you perfectly did, to keep the valve in its place. Because if it dived in the ventricle, sometimes it gets uh, hooked and it gets stuck in the feeders and it, has, it will be difficult to get it back in position. The price to pay when you get the low puncture is you don't have a very good coaxiality, but you have a good pushability as you had uh, to get in. And then here is a just push and pull on the wire, and you can keep the pusher slightly in the, in the LA and make some the flex. Navigator screen, please? It's the first and the second operator so, working together yeah, to manipulate the wire and the device, exactly. So if you look here, uh, three of us are working on this. So uh, I have uh, Dr. Prashant holding the sheet here, which is sewed in, and uh, for any additional support. So I've got the wire and the sheet. So I normally try and use the wire, either pull or push, to find a gist uh, until the last minute. and. Uh, Anand Raman is on my right. He's going to go with the inflation very slowly so that it allows us to reposition uh, until at least up to 50% of uh, the inflation, uh, we hope. Because you can see here, we are never ever going to get it parallel. This trajectory, this, this uh, uh, parallax will change as the valve goes up, and we'd like to be able to change this position up to the last minute. So, this position, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just going to come back a bit because. Uh, as I alluded to, the valve, uh, I think the valve is slightly lower on the marker if you see here on this view. I don't know if you agree, so therefore I'm going to leave the center marker slightly more ventricular uh, rather than uh, a bit more uh, towards the atrium that I would normally do. That's because the, it's an important point to recognize that the valve is not between the edge markers. Uh, I hope uh, you have, uh, you, you agree, you all agree there. Yes. Any comments there from the stage? No, no we Antonio? agree with we, oh, ag no. we agree with what you entirely. Think? I was actually wondering whether the echo might help you as well. Have you still got have you got a transesophageal echo probe down still? Yes, sure. Yes, sure. yes, yes, we do. We do. Sure, we sure. do. Just uh, retract it a bit. Dr. Chandrasekhar is going to show you. You can show you the three D echo yeah. also. I think uh, we'll go r r real time live PE so that you can see what uh, what you're going to be seeing. Um, so here you see the four chamber view. LA, LV, and the prosthetic valve, and this is the valve which is just straddling that area. You can easily see the catheter. So uh, I think most of the time at our center when we do that, we just do it with the 3D on first view. So I'm going to show you how we are going to get a 3D on first view. What view so did you mention on the echo? On Indon. Pardon? What view did it's you mention on the echo? It fast views. Oh, it's called as you're looking on, on face with the plane what you want to look at. So this is the valve as such you can see. This is the valve which is mounted on the catheter that is through the prosthesis. So it's called as, you may call it, uh, we call it an on pause view. E yeah. Or the surgeon, surgeon's view. Surgeon's view. That is the surgeon's view. On pause. So now you can see it nicely. This is on the 
from the atrial surface and we can also tilt it and look at on the ventricular surface right here and in this view your outflow tract is right here and this is the catheter mounted valve and the valve is seen right nicely here so I think the, 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 yeah, the point curious. is looking at here probably by the time it's being deployed it will be coaxial right now it's shooting towards anterior aspect right here Thank you. Okay, great. Let's move to fluoro, please. Can we check pacing? One volt, okay. Go up to uh, maximum voltage. So the, key, the key element here, Gopi, as you know, is a very slow uh, patient deployment and allow you time to adjust if necessary. I know you know yeah. that, but I'm emphasizing it for the audience. Absolutely. 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 Thank you very much. So, ready? Yeah. Maximum output, go at 180 beats per minute, please. Breathing off. Breathing off. Pacing on. Okay. Okay, what is the pressures? 50. Okay, 200, please. Go to 200. 200. 200, go up slowly. Slowly, I'm adjusting, going a bit forward. Okay, go up slowly. Slowly. Okay, I'm happy. Keep going. Keep going, Anathraman. Oh, yeah. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. I'm happy there. Go all the way, please. Yeah. All the way. Oh. Okay. Stop pacing. Stop pacing, please. Come on, come down. It looks a bit embolized there to me. Yeah. How, how does it look, sir, in the LV? The echo? Okay. No, the LV. Get the echo ready, please. So it was in the perfect position yeah, until perfect. the final 20% uh, of deployment when Absolutely. it just embolized into the, into the ventricular portion. The we question is whether it's stable in that position correct. or not. Correct. Anyway, it's better to prepare That's another one to, fix, to, to hold it in place. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just get a 26 ready, please. Another 26 ready. There are injections. There is no LVOT option. So we have a pressure here. Uh, we have uh, 80 by 50, so mm -hmm. there's no LVOT obstruction. It's four shot and too much from the uh, left atrium. Yeah, please do. Could we get a 26 ready? So uh, at this point of time, I just have two concerns in my mind. If you try to put go in with a second valve, that valve is going to embolize it further with the nose cone. And now if you try to put another valve inside this valve, remember the leaflets of this valve are going to cover the uh, struts of the cover valve, and it's going to be a ceiling skirt all the way to the LV output tank. What is your thought for this? Antonio, any thoughts? Yes. You can check on the echo. Okay, we I have hear you, Ravinder. So we are checking on echo, Ravinder, uh, because we have a very good uh, uh, pressure now, 116 by 64. And uh, there's no signs of LVOT obstruction based on the pressure. Let's get uh, some uh, uh, LVOT views, please. OK. Yeah. Do the paravalvular deep. So can we play that? Can we have the ECMO ready? I just wonder whether uh, the fluoroscopy look like a tear. How, how does it look in the echo, sir? T. Can you just show us the echo image? Uh, up the uh, echo image, yeah, up there. Okay, great. So it's just holding on to the pillars. Yes. Yes. That is what we see on fluoro. Well, I think that the valve is still. Partly, uh, partly supported by the 
within, within the processes itself is not actually it's not floating fully around in the LV. So, yeah. so you can see here, part, partly it is supported. So because we have the wire through, yeah. so uh, you know it's not going to fly away. So even if it goes more ventricular, it is going to be within the wire. Uh, at which point then we'll go on ECMO and uh, we will retrieve it from the LV apex. That is the uh, plan B, but plan A will be to take another valve and to try and sandwich that valve uh, and place the second valve slightly higher and uh, restore normal mitral function. That's the hope, but let's see. So Gopi, just to ask you, are you happy for us to stay with you or do you want us to allow you to work quietly and we'll take some lectures? What would be best for you? Okay, do you want to take lectures and come back to us, please? Let's do that. Let, let's do that. Let's do that while you get your cells collected and make sure that everything is okay with the patient. So we, we've shown two cases from the That's next right. session to fill in the space. And we were just using one of those cases to okay. use as a link to your case because there were some similarities with positioning okay. a, a transcatheter mitral valve uh, and one or two of the similar problems that you encountered. So tell us exactly what your thinking is and what yeah. you've managed to achieve while you've been working. Yes, yeah. So com coming to the mitral here, so uh, I'll tell you where we started the mitral program in India. The very first mitral was a transapical. I, I heard uh, uh, about the um, uh, transapical, which is the, probably the very first uh, uh, case that we did here, and we also published, and uh, that gives fantastic control, without doubt. We then wanted to do a transvascular, but Edwards was not available for use in the mitral position. Then we moved to a transjugular, transeptal route. And only after Edwards uh, became available, uh, then we've been doing the transvenous transeptal. So we've come a long journey in this country, and having done, uh, you know, uh, all the various uh, kinds of uh, mitral valve implantation under every single uh, approach, we've learned a bit through complications also. So coming back to our case, there was, uh, let me get the fluoro. So this fluoro you can see here, uh, Clearly, we felt uh, the valve uh, was slightly non-aligned to the markers, which we agreed. And therefore, this was the position when we wanted to wrap it base. Go. So, we don't have, uh, for some reason, the fluorograph did not take the point where it uh, slipped out. But there was significant resistance in inflation of the atrial end which I don't know if you, uh, any one of you in the, in the audience noticed. So it, we think it may be because of significant panis in the valve. It just didn't allow us to open up the atrial side and the entire valve system lemon seeded towards the LV. So we, we made the same observation, seed, Gopi. See it lemon seed. We made the same observation okay, about the then balloon. Then the we, wondered if it re we wondered if it related to the sheath okay. or some other mechanical problem. Panis is an so, interesting uh, suggestion. The pusher was well behind. The, the pusher was well behind. You can see there, you know, the balloon ain't uh, uh, proximal to the distal marker anyway. So I think the pusher being too far down is uh, not the case. But I could sense the valve slipping down as uh, the balloon was going up. So therefore, I started pulling back with the hope that we will get some anchoring. Uh, and where we ended up is what you can see, which is the valve was uh, just uh, anchored to the stent posts. So now, uh, scratching our heads, there were two options here. One is uh, we sandwich this with another um, uh, valve. Uh, and uh, the main concern is while sandwiching, how is this valve going to behave? Because mind you, I've got to take this nose cone carefully out without dislodging, and then the, the worst uh, step will be to introduce the new valve, which should not go and push it forward. Uh, so that's the other challenge we had. The other option, of course, will be to uh, go on the pump and uh, retrieve this and uh, do a transapical uh, valve implantation also. So we got prepared for that. We got the ECMO cannulas out. We got the ECMO machine ready. Uh, before we took the uh, 
uh, a delivery system out and uh, we decided to uh, uh, go with the option one and then escalate to option uh, two if uh, as a bailout. So next one please. So uh, next one. So here you can see here the idea was to try and retroflex as much as possible which means we center the nose cone as much as possible to the center of the valve and then take it out without interfering with the unstable first valve. Next one. Next. Back. Okay, so here you can see how the valve is coming out very carefully. I have uh, retroflexed fully. You can see it from the pusher system. Uh, and uh, we're pulling back on the wire to try and get the soft bit there to try and get the nose cone uh, go with the wire bias and here you can see the nose cone is past the distal end of the stent and I was happy there and uh, at that stage we just uh, I just pulled the entire system out so once this was done the next step of course is the important step get the new valve next so this is the uh, new valve that went in, it was uh, loaded, this is the loading you can see here and uh, we made sure we loaded slightly more than what we would do, which I hope you can appreciate here because as the valve retroflexes, it is possible the markers can move. So to correct for that, uh, I, I made sure the distal marker of the balloon uh, actually sank in uh, at the inflow, uh, the outflow of the valve. Next. So here when we were about to cross, I made sure there was full retroflexion uh, while the wire was being pulled and very carefully tried to center the entire system and there we went in. Next, once we went in, uh, we tried to get a position which was uh, this time at least 50-50 and the idea was we had to sandwich that and uh, we make sure we don't embolize this one. So to get that balance, we thought a 50-50 would be good. And the idea was to go really full on to make sure we flare on both ends so that the first valve doesn't embolize in the ventricle, this doesn't embolize in the atrium, and this actually catches the first valve. These were the three endpoints to be achieved in one inflation uh, without a lemon seeding the first one from overinflation. So that was the plan. So next one. Okay, and here we go, uh, we rapid paste, and uh, you can see here, uh, we, once we caught the valve, we went full on, you can see here, a full uh, dog boning on either ends, uh, suggesting we had inflated uh, fully, uh, both on the ventricular side and uh, the atrial side, and uh, the systole ain't gonna push this valve anywhere else. So we'll just show that one more time. longer valve complex than expected, but uh, that's okay. Next one. Uh, throughout this time of note, uh, there was no LVOT obstruction. We were not expecting that because we had a very wide iotomitral angle. And uh, here you can see deflation. Next. Come back. Next. Next. And here again, the nose cone with full flexion uh, uh, was uh, removed, making sure it doesn't disrupt any of the valves that were implanted. Next. Next. And uh, we just exchanged the stiff wire for uh, a, a pigtail. Next. Next. And uh, the pigtail was subsequently removed. Next. And. Uh, this is the final position. This is the end on uh, appearance. Next. And this is this uh, REO projection. The, uh, uh, can we move to hemodynamics, please? So the hemodynamics shows a normal systemic pressure with uh, no inotropic support. And uh, the LA pressure dropped down from 40 to 20. Uh, and uh, the echo shows uh, no valvular regurgitation and this valve is functioning normally. We'll show you the LV uh, and uh, we're done.
Eu te chorei com Deus. Uh, we did not have to go on the pump and we did not have to upsize the Venus or the arterial sheets. Uh, uh, so all is good and the patient as well. So is the echo there for us to see, Gopi? Here we are. Yeah, yes. that's uh, coming up there. So you can see, uh, can you get some color? I think the, the, you, you can see the leafless bulb and hardly any regurgitation. Can we get and the you, can, you can see the part, part, part of that other tissue is a little bit right here, but otherwise overall uh, the prosthetic function looks very good. And the most important thing ACT. here was about since the important mitral regurgitation is being taken away, what will be the aortic gradient? And the aortic gradient what we got was I'll get it right here now. So that's the end on view of the... Uh, yeah, go Offload track gradient, I'll get it. Abu? Show the hemodynamic screen, please, as a picture in picture. People, they are. I hope you can. I hope you can see the hemodynamic screen too. Yeah, we see that the pressure is one one thirty ninety one thirty. 140, 140, 80. 80 yeah, yeah, around that, yeah. And the LA pressure is the blue, uh, so which 80. is third on line, which is 18. So the pre-procedure LA pressure was 40, now it is 18. And just to confirm, there's no mitral okay, gradient, because so we can't see the leaflets of the, no, the no. ventricular valve working no. clearly. Give us the gradient, please. Yeah, no, no, the uh, no gradient. mitral the, gradient the, is... I didn't check it yet, but I'll check it and let you know. But I think here is the outflow track gradient, which has not changed much. It was about 16 before, it's about the same, and there's no outflow track Can obstruction. Can you go to the camera from the hemodynamic? Okay, so if we could see Gopi and the team again then, please. Let's get the gradient, please. Yeah. Now, we, now we see those ventricular leaflets. That's reassuring, thank you. So, so the mean gradient across the mitral valve is two millimeters. Great. And maximum gradient is three. I mean, three point six. Very good. Very mm. good. So we have a mean gradient of two. That is the value we have. And I think this is a fantastic, uh, you know, method of uh, doing this. Yeah. Perfect. Come off, uh, well done, Gopal. So Gopi, can we come back to you full screen with the team, please? Because we'd like to see yes, you just to yes, con just yes, to. Yes. We want to just congratulate you. We're going to go back. We're going to go to the back to the main session we're going now. To go to react. Yes, you can go and come back. Yeah. But we're, go we're going to thank you very much for your expert handling of a difficult situation. The team were obviously very cool and coordinated together. So a formal round of applause, please, from the main arena. But Gopal, before you uh, leave the room, are you not planning to close the defect? <laughs> Uh, no, because the defect is small, and I think we had enough drama today, so okay. we, won't, we don't want no, to have time. any okay. more drama. Good. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, congratulations from us all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, he wanted us to come uh, just to do a briefing, so uh, here we are. I think the patient is well now, is about to be extubated, and the uh, mitral valve uh, function is normal with a gradient of 1.99 and no MR and uh, LV is as good as what it was before. Uh, now there's a lot of uh, left atrial smoke 
which we did not see before because the patient had severe MR, which is expected. So the patient is going to be on anticoagulation anyway from her atrial fibrillation. We are not going to reverse anything. All the large sheets are out and uh, things are okay. Uh, but we, we wanted to have a discussion, so Bernard wanted to come back, which is why we're here. So if any questions we can take, we have another two, three minutes before we wind up here and uh, come on. Are there any questions from the audience? So Gopi, they… Uh, you went there, they did show it. He put a valve in a second valve. Gopi, in terms of uh, follow-up… Can we see the echoes from them? In terms of the follow-up, yes, what… Yes, could you see the final echo now? Yeah. So yeah, we could I'll just show you we would the like to see the final, final echoes. We saw that as because well. Because some of them went there because they all went out for chai. So while you're there getting the echo, Gopi, in terms of fo follow-up of this patient, what would you… Uh, what are the things that you would, that would that may concern you? Because now you have a very long so uh, stentor segment in a very uh, small space. Absolutely. Uh, the main concern is uh, thrombosis. So uh, we are planning to leave the patient on an antiplatelet and an anticoagulant uh, because the patient was previously just on acithrome. Now uh, we would add uh, Plavix 75 also in addition just to give an extra uh, anti-thrombotic uh, uh, medication on board and uh, we will uh, follow her up very closely for thrombosis uh, and uh, LVOT obstruction I think that it's very very clear LVOT is absolutely uh, normal on echo uh, so we are convinced we are not going to have any late LVOT obstruction that's out this is after all the stiff system is out so therefore there's no concern that uh, the delivery systems had a bias uh, keeping it away from the LVOT that's all out LV is good, so mainly thromboembolic prophylaxis and uh, that we wish to achieve uh, with what I just said now. Uh, any inputs or suggestions from uh, the expert panel? There are some, uh, not many fortunately, but there are literature uh, comments about uh, prosthesis being left too much protruding left ventricle causing uh, late VSDs and uh, left ventricular muscular trauma due to the constant rubbing. Uh, her LV looked quite small, and she has probably about 12 centimeter, uh, 12 millimeters of frame in the left ventricle. What is the risk of uh, how? And if there, what if there are risk of causing trauma to left ventricle free wall? How would you follow that patient up? I think it's uh, well, a very valid point. We were concerned what uh, the distal end was doing. Thankfully, the orientation of the uh, mitral bioprocess is more towards the apex as opposed to the septum, which is why the iotomitral angle was quite wide. Therefore, there's plenty of room, even though her LV is, uh, you know, fairly small and non-dilated, non there is no contact or there's plenty of room from the outflow end of the valve uh, to any part of the LV that we went through very critically with echo. Uh, and we were happy that that wasn't going to be a problem in the long term, nor any irritation even nearby causing uh, arrhythmias. That, that was not a concern also. And you can see from the 3D echo, which has been rotated from the edges to the ventricular side, slightly so. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. The, the, uh, the amount that is actually uh, embolized into the LV is, uh, is only about uh, eight or nine millimeters that we measured from the uh, bioprosthetic strut. It is literally just below, the inflow of the first valve is just below the epic ring. Uh, so there's not much protruding out, thankfully. Uh, so, uh, and whatever is protruding, it's, it's nowhere near any part of the LV that is very clear on the echo. The uh, distance between the serving ring of uh, surgical bioprocesses to the sub serving ring structure is only 2 millimeter, and the total length of the valve is 14.5 millimeter. So I was pretty sure this valve is not going to embolize because it is in contact with, with at least 12 millimeter, and 12 millimeter is a long, big contact for any transcatheter valve with its radial force. And then I would like to talk about the emergency bailout strat strategy. Although this team has gone through the rigors and a very cool cat fashion, we have tackled it. But if somebody falls into this catastrophic circumstances, the best thing is to do the first operator did an arterial cannulation, 
the second operator does a venous cannulation immediately with the ampulla superstrip wire because the venous cannula is not going to go. Make sure that you use uh, Edwards second generation ECMO venous cannula. The reason is you have a septal puncture, so there will be air entrainment in the cannula. So you have this two stage second generation ECMO Edwards cannula which has got holes proximally and distally, so it can drain the SVC and IVC. Do a rapid mini thoracotomy, don't do ventriculotomy at all. Right thoracotomy, mini thoracotomy, expose the LA, go inside, do not arrest the heart, let it fibrillate. Take out the valve from the ventricle, crimp it again and deploy it in the direct vision. That is the way it has to be managed. Not you try to expand the valve and do a open mitral valve replacement and uh, that will create a long bypass time. All this procedure can be performed within 30 minutes actually. I see that's very, uh, very, very, very well said uh, and uh, a great bailout I think uh, people have to be aware because whilst we were on camera live, we went through plan A, plan B and this was a plan C. So everything was lined up, the ECMO was ready, the surgical tray was ready and the plan was to go in and do exactly uh, what, what was uh, just said, which is take that out, crimp it back and put it back under direct vision. Uh, that will be the best thing to do because converting to surgical will only invite more problems, i.e. surgical mitral valve replacement. And uh, on the echo interior, I could not see the entry leaflet of the mitral valve. I'm assuming that was uh, removed during the original surgery. Is that right? That was chopped off. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Absolutely. So I think that's yes, important yeah, yeah. for those yeah, who are thinking of doing this procedure. Uh, in your own unit. It's important to speak to the surgeon who did the procedure or look at the notes to see whether they did my, uh, leaflet sparing or removed this, the leaflet because the risk of uh, outflow obstruction is significantly removed, almost non-existent if the entry leaflet of the mitral valve has been removed during the original surgery. Then you can be a little bit more confident that no matter which way your valve is orientated or whatever size the left ventricle is, the risk of occluding the outflow during deployment of a valve in valve or mitral position it's significantly reduced, if not diminished completely. So maybe, uh, Gopi, you'd like to summarize for everybody here. And before you do that, I'd just like to congratulate you and everybody I, I think, in, the, uh, uh, in the room for an excellent, excellent uh, uh, case presentation and bailout strategy as well. Thank you. Thanks. Thank uh, it's you. been fantastic uh, panel uh, discussion and uh, a great, uh, great case. We learned a lot. So uh, thank you for being with us. Okay. Thank you.